Mac Football Forever. I'm Alex. That's Caleb. We're here today to talk about the Buffalo Bulls in the State of the Maction series. We're about halfway through this. We just got done recording the Western Michigan one. Obviously, we're going to talk about the other fun team in that series because usually when like West, Western and Buffalo should just play each other every year. Let's yeah. let's start this episode by talking about that. They, those two should play every year. It seems like something that should definitely happen. And uh, if you're not, if you're holding that up, um, you're wrong. By the off chance that someone listens to this who has a say in that matter, uh, make it happen. Buffalo though has been just better than what it was, you know, ten years ago. You know, Buffalo was a team that, you know, and I'm sure people to an extent still believe that it should drop back down to FCS or just not FBS at any level. It just doesn't matter. Just go back down. Uh, but Buffalo's like, no, we are committed to FBS football. And with the new hire of Lance Leipold a few years ago, uh, Buffalo's better branded itself, you know, just because it's a winning games in the Mac. No one watches games in the Mac, but hey, we've heard of some names that have played for Lance Leipold lately. Uh, what, you know, what's been the biggest impression of Buffalo over the past years to you? now that they've been in two MAC championship games in three years. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're a very respectable program. You expect, uh, even, even if you feel like you're superior talent or scheme wise, you never would feel comfortable going in and playing Buffalo and being like, Oh yeah, we're winning this game for sure. Like you're never going to think that against Buffalo, obviously this year, um, them being the class of the Mac for most of the year, that was never going to be in the thought process, but just the way that this team has played, and, you know, the types of players they featured, some of the better wide receivers that have come through there, some of their running backs, um, and even on the defensive side of the football, obviously, and Leipold's time, like, they all, they have featured very consistently some of the best players in the MAC since Khalil Mack was there. And I know that's pre-Leipold, but, like, ever, ever since Mack's there every year, they've had one of the best players in the MAC at, at a certain spot, and it's just held true. Running back's been where it's been at for the last few years. And, you know, they, it's not super sexy. It's not like, no, no like, one's yeah, telling you it's fun to watch. No runs. one's, no one's saying watch Buffalo football because it's like good and enjoyable. Like the other team we talked about, Western. Uh, no, no, Buffalo runs the ball two thirds of the time. Do you really want to keep watching that? I like it. I love yeah, the team sure. that can just go, but... go downhill and run the ball for eight, nine, 10 yards about every other time or, have something like marks that can just gash you with his speed and they're not razzle dazzle they're not um they're not running anything world like they're not running world beating stuff they're not running anything that just blows you away like with the complexity of it but it's just for me it's fun to watch them just do the simple things offensively really well block everything up front really well uh do things off of one another you know build build a playbook off of each other simple play action stuff uh simple crossing route stuff suck the linebackers up and Hit a, hit a guy crossing across the middle or a tight end or something. And, you know, they've had some of the better defenders in that time. And at the risk of just, you know, going on and on and, and ranting about or just saying how much I like every aspect of their team, uh, I like where Buffalo is as a program probably more than any other team in the league. Just you expect them in a full season they're going to win 10 games. And I expect that now going forward pretty much every year. Speaking of going forward, that's pretty much all Jared Patterson did last year. And let's start by talking about that is that Buffalo, you know, like I just said, they ran the ball two thirds of the time because it ran over everybody, specifically Jared Patterson. Like I said, uh, he left early after his junior season uh, played, you know, uh, 26 games in his first two years and six games last year, uh, 141 carries, 1,072 yards, 7.6 yards per carry, 19 touchdowns. Uh, he scored 19 touchdowns in six games and uh, had 19 touchdowns as a sophomore, too, when he had just about 1,800 yards. He also had 1,000 yards as a freshman. Uh, that's why you ran the ball two-thirds of the time. Him and Kevin Marks, Ron Cook, you know, and, you know, they had some other guys that have been developing in the system that will be competing for more playing time later. Patterson was amazing. He was overlooked by so many schools. Uh, even my alma mater, you know, he was in Creighton's office and he said no. Um, and Patterson just made them all look like fools. I don't know. You know, we said it before. We don't know if it'll translate into the NFL, but for Buffalo specifically, that was the identity was that they took underused or underappreciated talents, groomed them the fuck up 
and ran over everybody in the East. The problem is that it didn't win a title, but I mean, that that's the style of Buffalo. That's the style of Buffalo. And they ran through you if you let them. Kent State, yeah. obviously, the, you know, Patterson's, you know, 409 day was against them and they were one of the worst in the, you know, in the league against uh, the run. So it was Bowling Green. What What's most impressive to you about the way Buffalo runs the ball? Um, I think it's namely that everybody knows how good they are at it and it doesn't really matter what they draw up. They're not going to slow them down. Uh, and I say that and there absolutely are exceptions. So I've got to, I've got to be careful of my words because Miami did slow Patterson a bit, but it didn't matter. Right. Ball state slowed Patterson down, but he got hurt. Nobody had any answer for him. And it took until ball state figured it out. And it's not like this is a surprise. Patterson and Marks have been doing this for three years. Like they've been doing it since 2018. Those were the guys who were the primary ball carriers in the Mac championship game against NIU that entire season. They combined for that had to be over 2000 yards. I can't remember how many, but it was a lot. And they were one of the more productive uh, running back duos in the conference as young as they were. And everybody knows what Buffalo wants to do. In the time since the 2018 championship game, they've lost better wide receivers. They've lost more dynamic playmakers and better a better quarterback. And they're still a more efficient offense, which is freaking absurd. They don't do anything complex. They don't trick you about anything. If they have, I'm missing it. Um, it speaks to what they do up front on the offensive line. And it speaks to what, like what Leipold's built. Cause he's had several different offensive line coaches in that time. And then just how special Marks and Patterson are as a duo. I don't know whether to expect Marks to be a superstar next year or just like, you know, a pretty good back. But if you, anybody who runs behind that offensive line, I feel like half the running backs in the Mac could go for a thousand yards based on what they do based on what Buffalo does. I think that's a good way to jump into our second point. Uh, which is kind of a question, you know, what's sort of the biggest difference between this 28, the 2018 team and the 2020 team? Because uh, they went to the Max Championship game, like I said, twice in three years, but they looked really different on offense. You know, you run the ball a lot versus not run the ball a lot because in 2018 they had Terry Jackson, you know, uh, KJ Osborne, Antonio, yep. Anthony Johnson, Charlie Jones, and then he transferred out after his freshman year. I don't know why. And th- th- who was the tight end who was really good? I'm blanking on his name. Um, uh, he went to Maryland, though. Tyler Mabry. Yeah. You know, they had different looking playmakers there. And then they sold out so much to the run. I don't know. I feel like that was a little bit unexpected. But, like, I, does it also kind of speak to, like, this team's ability to, like, get another, like, quarterback or receiver, or a combination of the two to have that same kind of success? You know, like if if they could, you know, peel off, you know, that kind of success in practice, of course they'd put it in on game day. Uh, but they just haven't had that same kind of, you know, connection with a dynamic receiver and a dynamic quarterback. Yeah, they've had pretty good run with with Van Trees and Antonio Nunn out there as you know yeah. QB one wide receiver one, but certainly not the same. Not not even close. No, and I mean the Miami game was a nice little wake up call that Van Trees was capable of of you know upping the ante this year and. Um, he had another game later in the year that's escaping me that they, they played a lot better football. Um, uh, then you look at the end of the season and they kind of, you know, they dropped the ball a little bit against, they still did out and they were committed to the, the pass against Ball State. And part of me wondered if that was, even with Jarrett Patterson struggling, if that was part of the reason that they, their offense stalled against Ball State in the MAC championship game. But um, then they go into Marshall last game of the season, Jarrett Patterson doesn't play. And it, it, Marshall had one of the better defenses in the country this year and, I never really expected them to do anything special. Uh, so there wasn't really anything in particularly impressive about the last two games after they averaged above 50 points for most of the season. So um, I think that I have to imagine wide receiver was a priority. I don't know anything about the recruiting class or uh, potential transfers in, um, but they do have to have something to open up the offense a little bit in some respect. Uh, somebody more, rel- somebody not as reliable as Antonio Nunn, but something by committee and maybe somebody's going to catch us by surprise, come out of nowhere. Yeah. Offensively, like it's not something to stress too much about. They might not have the weapons that you'd like at some spots, but it certainly wasn't a problem when they were running the ball 45 times a game for like five yards of carry. <laughs> yeah. And you know, the reasons like why they sold out to the run so much in 2020 um, and 2019 too, um, 
is why I think that, and this will move us into point three, Sure. We should expect more of the same in 2021. You know, Marx is coming back. Thankfully, he was in the portal for like a week, uh, came back to school in Buffalo. Ron Cook, he was cooking a little bit as a freshman, uh, redshirt freshman it was, got a little bit of playing time as kind of RB3, uh, got some looks as a specialist out there too. And, you know, but like some guys behind him, I thought, you know, when Dylan McDuffie signed, he was a local kid. He's like, he's a sophomore right now. Tajay Ahmed, he's a sophomore too. I think Kobe Burrell, I don't, he's an underclassman too. They, Buffalo focused a lot on recruiting its running backs and doing a, you know, pretty swell job at that. And it's obviously kept them all in the system. Like this, it's a position where they loaded up so much where I kind of thought at some point, one of these names would have hit the transfer portal by now. That could all change in like a day or a month right. or three months, obviously. Or after spring football. But whoever doesn't transfer out, if at all, you know, that means they're so much closer to seeing the field. And they saw, you know, what it was like, you know, all these guys are not, you know, highly recruited athletes, just like the guys that were in front of them. And so it'll be interesting. It's interesting to see, you know, like have running backs play, you know, in a system where they want to give the ball to the running backs, right? Like that's what they want. It's not in all the other offenses where like it's pass first more than likely, you know, they want to say, no, we're not, we're not doing a RPO. We're going to RRR. That's what we're going to do. So then the pirates now got it. Yeah. Well, I, I, I do think it's a very, very talented running back room. Yeah. I am very interested in seeing whether cook, uh, whether somebody we don't know of is going to be a guy who takes some carries next year. Um, I would assume Cook is, unless somebody's leaping him. Maybe. I don't know. I feel like everybody's capable of recruiting a, uh, a freshman who can be like a, a, a bigger name. Um, I think, you know, if it's if you have Ohio Bobcats, you're not going to do it. I think Buffalo could find a wide receiver or a back right now. That's going to make a big difference. And it could if, be like next year. So maybe with somebody we don't know yet. Given a full season, how many yards do you think Kevin Marks will put up? Just – um, I think I'm probably going in like the 1200. You think 1200? Sure. If he yeah. gets to 1200 exactly, he will be third in school history in career rushing yards. Right, right, right. Like, like 60, 63 yards fewer than Jared Patterson. Okay. So that's, you know, passing Jared Patterson in career rushing yards. It's very much in the cards for Kevin Marks. Mm-hmm. So that's just a storyline to look forward to. Currently, Brandon Oliver leads uh, the school record with 4,049. Patterson obviously stopped short, like shorter than we expected him to, uh, 3,884. But obviously, like the clip he was running at is so hard to you know keep up with, like six, like 7.6, yeah. like insane. Um, and Kevin Marks, he's down, down, down at seventh, 2,621. They've had some fun running backs in the last couple of years and some fun, hella fun offensive players. I hope um, I hope for their sake they figure it out at wide receiver. Uh, some of the biggest losses heading into 2021, though, there's like a good mix of like noticeable losses and some guys that I think that they can still like replace. Like Jared Patterson, incredibly hard to replace. However, if like that running back room is as talented as it is and, uh, you know, the offensive line still knows their assignments, even with the losses of Jake Fuzak and KOD Awosoka, it was mm-hmm. Awosika. God, man, why can't I say it? I'm just not. I don't know, not, but it is, it is a recurring theme. <laughs> you know what else is a reoccurring thing? Us okay. saying the phrase world beaters. You say that. You say it too. You said it this episode. <laughs> they're not razzle dazzle. They're not, um, they're not running anything world, like they're not running world beating stuff. They're not running anything that just blows you away, like with the complexity of it. But you say that. They're gonna miss Jared Patterson a ton. <laughs> they're gonna they're gonna miss Antonio Nunn a ton. Um, but who do you think they might miss the most? Like out of all these names? Uh I it's so hard for me not to say none because I don't know of anybody that is supposed to step up and be the guy at wide receiver. Trevor Wilson. Trevor Wilson, right? Trevor no, Wilson, Trevor Wilson's Wilson coming Trevor back as well. Oh, is gonna be the guy you're saying. I'm like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, no, they're not gonna miss Trevor Wilson. Um, I, I he's guess right there. he didn't go anywhere. He's a big play guy. I don't know if he's the guy number one type. I don't know how I feel about Trevor Wilson because I didn't see enough. I mean, and and you know that's fair because I mean they didn't give you enough to go by. Like they threw the ball a third of the time. 
And yeah. it's not like it was completed 100% of the time. And it wasn't always to, you know, the other receivers. Like uh, Antonio Nunn had 37 receptions, and then the next guy had 20. You know, and like it was a shortened year. Everything was so, so condensed. So, yeah, yeah I mean, your knowledge should be very thin on this wide receiver group. The more I look at this team, the more I'm like, they don't even have like they lose a start defensive end, they lose a start running back, they lose a start wide receiver, but the 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 foundation is so good that they should still win the MAC East again unless Kent State figures it's crap out on defense, or Miami surges back again. Uh, I think Miami has enough issues that they probably won't get back to that point this next year, but who knows? Either way, the foundation is good enough. It wouldn't surprise me in the least if Buffalo is back in the same position averaging maybe a few points less, maybe like 45 or 44 points per game and uh, is like nine wins heading into a MAC championship game type appearance. Still wouldn't surprise me. Uh, One of the losses that they're going to have is major to uh, Malcolm Koontz. You know, Mm -hmm. um, he was, we were high on him last year because he was incredible last year. And this year, uh, six and a half tackles for loss, five sacks, two pass breakups, four quarterback hurries. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on the defense here. Uh, just know that they are really good and they still, you know, even though they lose Malcolm Coons, Tyree Thompson, who was only there for a year and Roy Baker at mm-hmm. corner, you know, there's still so much of a good foundation there at Buffalo where, you know, yeah. you, you, you'll like what you see and like, uh, yeah, there's not too much back. of style change there, but what's that? Yeah. Kadofi writes back. Kadofi and, right. Yeah. Um, Tim, you know, Tim Terry, think- James Patterson, uh, Max Michelle, like yeah. I, I think he's a really good linebacker uh, that you know really came out last year. So there's a lot of good pieces there. Taylor Riggins could be back, and you know, in addition to that, uh, him, Kadofi Wright, you know, like you mentioned, James Patterson. Yeah, I mean, it's still it's, a really it, good core. Yeah, yeah, very good core. Last topic, though, obviously, last topic is always ded- dedicated to the coaches. Lance Leipold at the time was a, was a good hire. Still is a great hire. Yeah. You know, and it's unfair if anybody was like, oh, he was 109 and six at Wisconsin Whitewater and expected anything to be the same. So far, he's 37 and 33 at Buffalo, which is incredibly hard to do in itself. He's gotten Buffalo to three straight bowl seasons. He's gotten them to a top 25 ranking. He's gotten them to two MAC title games in three years. He's gotten them to, you know, some sort of semblance of an identity, even though it's niche as hell. Um, I'm sure like people that pay attention to football know that there's something good and stable in a Lance Leipold led system here. Yeah. Um, You know what, I mean, what do you make of Lance Leipold's career at Buffalo so far? And do you think that this stability is something to buy into the rest of his career for however long this 56 year old man stays there? He will be 57 this year. He has the authority of someone I could see being like thought, thought to be older. I think if you'd asked me how old I thought he was, I'd probably say like, oh, 62, 63, maybe. Like this guy's got them on such stable footing. They've changed their offensive identity in a short amount of time and still seen the success, like you mentioned. Their transition year from like, you know, a really heavy, like pass heavy team that, you know, could run the ball to a all run team and without missing a beat really like what, oh, their down season was winning seven games or eight games or whatever. And like, or going five and three in like 2019 or whatever it was. So yeah, like as long as he's there, and they don't have some massive blip or some transfer exodus, they're going to keep winning eight games every year or something or nine games every year. And they're capable of winning 10 any year because he's that damn good of a coach. They're on more stable footing than anybody else in this conference. I will fight anybody who tells me otherwise, or even suggested the thought of otherwise. That doesn't mean they're going to win a Mac championship in the next three or four years, but stability wise and expecting them to win Buffalo does it better than anybody in the conference. And Leipold's why there's a reason they picked a division three coach and said, you know what? We think you can do it here. They're not going to ask them to win national championships, in Buffalo. But if you're in the MAC and you're putting your team in the MAC championship game every other year, you're doing your job right. Off the top of your head, do you know how many uh, Division three titles he has? Uh, six. Do you know how many years he coached Division three football? Thirteen. Uh, no, but uh, no, as a head coach, eight. Okay. How many did he win? Six. I but mean, he he made it to seven. He made it to seven championships. Yeah, and lost. he was back and forth between them and Whitewater, or it was back back and forth between them and Mount Union every year for a while there. But I think that about closes it up. One of the best coach teams in the MAC, and you know, even though they it's it, it had to get a guy like Leipold, it 
had to get a guy like Leibold because it's not a talent rich area in New York. Sure, there's some good place, good pieces of of talent scattered in that area, but it's it's not like he's coaching in Ohio. It's not like he's coaching in Michigan. It's not like he's coaching, you know, down south where there's he can easily like drive next door to like you know yeah. a three star, two star kid that's just as good as you know what you'll find in New York. It's hard to find talent there. So for him to have just the stability he has in the Mac is damn yeah. near impressive. And he gets guys from all over the place, develops them. Next thing you know, they're a multi-year starter. Some guy from Virginia, some guy from uh, Michigan. From He's Michigan, getting Clint. guys from Michigan. He is getting guys from Michigan too, so that must hurt. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it really does. It's like ah, Rich Miller. Good to good to see you, man. You're doing a great job. He really is. But until then, uh, I don't know. Until what? Until what? Until you tweeted us, until you watch our next YouTube video? Until what? Until Kingdom Come. Until Buffalo wins a Mac title game. Until I figure out a good way to sign off. I'm Alex. That's Caleb. Yeah, man. Have a good night.